please rise as you I'm not on. Please rise as you are able for the Sorry. We'll get it adjusted momentarily. I think you're already risen. Please join us <laughs> in our call to worship today. We have come to worship God, the living God, who calls prophets and teachers. We have come to praise God in the midst of a hurting world with spoken word, with song, and with joy in our hearts. God hears our praise and answers the forces of hatred and hurt with the power of grace. We have come to worship God whose grace and love covers a multitude of wounds. The good news is that God chooses you and me to receive and carry the word of life and hope, and when necessary, we use words. Please remain standing for our processional song. seated. While we are so delighted to see you in worship this morning on this rainy Sunday morning here in Los Angeles, who knew it rains in Southern California? <laughs> and yet we are here. Some of you may have to swim to get here, but we're glad that you are here. 
We are so delighted to see you. If, you're fir- if it's your first time in worship with us today, I'm Reverend Keith Mazingo, the senior pastor, and we would like to say a special welcome to you. If you're new with us today for the very first time, would you just wave at me? Hello, hello. <laughs> and our ushers have something to give to you, and we want to say welcome. We're glad that you are here. Hope that you enjoy worship, and if you don't have a church home, by all means, know that you have found it now. We also want to say hello to those folks who are online. We know that lots of people join us online every Sunday, and some look during the week because we're videotaping as well as going live. And so, um, hello to you out there. Welcome from all over the world. We get people from all over the world. There are several faithful folks that are here uh, at all different time zones around the world. And so we're delighted to see you here. And also, to our folks who are here, if you haven't done so already, make sure you get out social media, check in, let people know it's time for church, and they can join us online uh, on our website or on our Facebook page. And I just want to say welcome. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that you did brave the elements today and come out for worship. I believe God has something important for us, and I'm glad that you came to, to worship in this place today. Would you take just now a moment to pass the peace and welcome one another? Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 through 10 from the Amplified Version. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and approved of you as my chosen instrument. And before you were born, I consecrated you to myself as my own. I have anointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then I said, O ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am a young man. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I, I, I am only a young man, because everywhere I send you, you will go, and wherever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them or those hostile faces, for I am with you always to protect you and deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hands and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, hear me, put my words in your mouth. See, and I, see I have anointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to uproot and break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and plant. Second reading comes from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapters four, verses 16 through 21, the, the, the message version. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been reared, as he always did on the Sabbath. He went to the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found a place where it was written, God's spirit is on me. God's chosen me to preach the message of the good news to the poor, sent me to announce the pardons pardons to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. I set the burden and battered free to announce this is God's year to act. He rolled up 
the scrolls, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him, intent. Then he started in. You have just heard the scriptures make history. It comes true just now in this place. Amen. Hear what the Spirit says today. your music ears on and here we go. Really good job. Well, many years ago, because I'm old, many years ago, I was living in North Carolina, my home state, and I was visiting a friend in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm from Goldsboro, but I had gone to visit my best friend in Greensboro, North Carolina. And that weekend, there was um, a, 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 a display at the museum that I wanted to go and check out. It was called The Real McCoy. Now, I didn't know exactly what I was in store for. I did know that it was about, now this is Black History Month. It must have been during Black History Month because this was about African-American inventors and their inventions. So I went to see what all of these inventions were about. And I got in and I found out about this man named, and they, they had actually named it The Real McCoy after this man and a Canadian-born African-American inventor named Elijah McCoy. Elijah McCoy lived from 1844 to 1929, and he, he was an engineer by trade. That was his education. But when he moved to Michigan, he could only find work as a fireman and as a worker on the railroad. He worked with the railroad system, the Michigan Central Railroad. Now, he had his own shop, and he invented 57 different things. He had lots of patents out on things that he had uh, built. He, uh, let me see. I thought I put it in my notes. Oh, yes, I did. Some of those inventions included the portable ironing board, now, the ironing board had already been invented, but it wasn't portable. It, you couldn't carry it from room to room. It had to stay in one place. So he and his wife wanted a, to be able to move around where she uh, ironed, so he invented the portable ironing board. He invented rubber soles for shoes, rubber heels. He also invented tread for tires. That makes sense, doesn't it? You see the connection. He also invented the lawn sprinkler. We use those all the time around here. But he is most famous for the automatic, automatic lubricator and oil lubricator for steam engines that they used in locomotives and in ships. Now, you may not really understand what that, it took me a while to figure this out. Back when they had the steam engines, they would run the steam engine for a while and then they had to stop it because they had to get out and physically 
re-oil everything in the motor and the wheels. So he, having working, working, that was his job for the railroad, so he came up with this idea that there could be an automatic oiler. So he perfected, he kept perfecting this oiler, this automatic oiler, so they didn't have to stop the train, which meant more productivity, it meant faster uh, trips, so they didn't have to stop every few miles to re-oil the train. So the trips got up, people liked it. Now, Mr. McCoy had done such a great job of this, and as usual, once you have a really good product, then copies of those products start popping up, right? So other people started making automatic oilers following his example. However, they were all inferior to his. His was the best. And so when they would work, when the railroads would call and to say they wanted to buy the automatic oilers, they would ask, is it the real McCoy? <laughs> so now you know where we got our phrase, the real McCoy. You see, they didn't want a copy. They wanted the real thing. They wanted the name brand. They wanted the one they knew they could count on. They wanted the one they knew was genuine. Now, what does that have to do with us today? Well, you see, people really want genuineness. People really want the real thing. And in a day that we have bastardized the word Christian and Christianity and even uh, organized religion in general and even the very idea of joining a church and coming to church, even in the rain, Coming to church and being part of that, that's a whole, a, a, a fading idea around us, isn't it? I meet people all the time that say, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't belong to a church. And that's wonderful. I'm glad they're spiritual. I really am. And I totally get that. I totally understand that they have a faith inside of them that they don't have to have church in order to love God and be God's child. I totally get that, and I agree with it. Here's the problem. When we don't have our community, we don't have a community of faith that we can share our joys, that we can share our sorrows, and Lord knows, even before church this morning, there were people saying, I just want to let you know this. This is changing in my life, right? There are things that happen so that we have a support group and we build our lives around this community of faith. But why do we pick this one as opposed to the one down the street? Because there are four right down the street in both directions. Why do we pick this one and I think I, I, yesterday, was it yesterday? Yesterday, I was, I was walking out front and this uh, gentleman, very handsome young man, gets out of his car and, and starts talking to me, asks me about the sign. Do you really think this is, you know, I, am I reading this sign right? I don't want to get a ticket. And he says, I'm thinking about moving to this community. Can you tell me about the community? And I said, well, I can tell you a little bit. There's some fabulous restaurants around here. <laughs> Some really good restaurants. There are a couple down here on this street, and there are several on this street. And, and, and he said, well, you know, I've been walking the neighborhood, and I've just been stopping to talk to people, and people seem to be pretty nice around here. I said, yes, they are. I said, and guess what? We have church right here. <laughs> and we're getting more and more people from our community who are coming into the building, not just walking by the building, because they want a community nearby where things are working, where things are happening, where good things are happening. They want the real thing. They want the real Christian, you see. They don't want just somebody who's claiming something, but they're not really living up to that. In our first reading today, we hear a conversation between the who became what before he became the prophet Jeremiah 
and God. And maybe it's been a conversation some of us have had with God. God says to Jeremiah, before I even formed you in the womb, before you were ever even thought of by your parents, before any of that, before they even got together, I knew you. I knew you. Before you were even a person, before you were even conceived, I knew you. I had even given you a name, and I had given you a ministry. And I want you to go and live out that ministry. And Jeremiah says, now, wait a minute, God. Whoa. I'm just a young man. I, ha I haven't had time to go and live my life yet. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not sure I'm capable of doing that. I haven't studied. I haven't, I haven't. And God said, don't tell me that. You're just making excuses. You're making excuses for what I'm calling you to do. You wanted me to call you, and now I'm calling. And then when, you, when, I, when I get there, you're saying, well, but wait a minute, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. And maybe it did take some time, and maybe it did take some study, and maybe it did take some community involvement. Maybe it took him some time to grow that relationship between him and God. But Jeremiah eventually said yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be reading about him today. He would have just faded off into the background. But he was the real deal, you see. He was the real McCoy. He was the one that had gotten called to do only the work that Jeremiah, the prophet, could do. He says, God, I don't even know how to speak. And God says, don't argue with me. Wherever I send you, you go, and whatever I tell you to say, I'll put my words in your mouth, and you just speak them. Well, how simple is that? How simple is that? If I, if I lead you, are you, are you re remembering some of the sermons of the last month? Wherever I lead you, wherever my hand guides you, you just go. When the doors open in front of you, just go in. If a door's closed in front of you, don't go. Don't bang on it. Don't try to get it to open. If it opens, go. If it doesn't open, don't go. When you get there, I'll tell you what to say. I will tell you. I'll put my words in you, and you'll have the real deal. Listen to what else he said. Don't be afraid of those people I send you to or to their frowning faces. I love that God added this on at the end. He says, because I am with you always to protect you and to deliver you. So even if they don't like what you're saying, remember it's not what you're saying, it's what I'm saying. You just say what I tell you to say. And I'll protect you. I'll protect you and I'll deliver you. What a promise. Was that just for Jeremiah? I don't think so. I think it was for us too. God knew us before we were even thought of. When we were not even in the womb, God knew us. God knew our spirits. God knew our name. God knew who would have us. God even had a calling for each one of us. Hmm. But are we all called to speak and preach? Well, no, not everybody is. So let's go to the second reading. The second reading, we have Jesus saying a very much the same thing. Jesus himself went to church. I want you to think about that for a second. Of all people, Jesus could have easily not gone to church and said, I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. You get that? But Jesus himself went to church. It said he went into the temple as was his custom. That's what the scripture says. It was his custom. It was his habit to be a part of a community of faith. And he went in and he got up. He was the reader. He got up and did what you just did, Maggie. He read the scriptures. 
And that particular day they were reading from, they didn't have the New Testament back then, by the way. So he was reading from the scrolls of the Old Testament, and he read from another prophet, not Jeremiah, but Isaiah. And he reads this, God's Spirit is on me. God has chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, set the burdened and the battered free, and to announce this is God's year to act. Now, wait a minute. So not everybody was called to preach. Maybe, Jesus says, by reading in the book of Isaiah, maybe there's something in there that we can do. It sounds like something that all of us could get done, doesn't it? Can't we take the message of good news to the poor? And that's not just poor people as financial poor. Sometimes people are spiritually poor. Can't we work at pardoning prisoners? And it's not just physical jails that people are in. Because how many of us have been caught up in some spiritual jails in the past? Oh, Lord, I know I have. And I was grateful every time somebody, somebody, and it usually wasn't the pastor, usually wasn't a preacher at, at all. I was thankful when somebody came by and unlocked my prison door and let me out and led me out. And sometimes they had to pull me out. Other times I was trying to get out so fast I wished right on past them. Recovery, can't we recover the sight to the blind? One more time, it's not always physical. There are those who are spiritually blind who can't see that we are all God's children. They can't see that each one of us has a calling on our lives, that before each one of us was born, God knew our names and had a calling for us. Can't we set the burdened and the battered free? Sure we can. And, uh, and, and here's an easy one. Can't we announce to the whole wide world, this is God's year to act. Not just to be, but to act. So let me ask you, how has your week been going? Have you been putting into practice what I, those new folks with us, you, you, you didn't get in on this, but go back and look at the last four sermons and you'll, you'll understand. I preached from, about the prayer of Jabez over the last month, and, and, the, and, and Pastor Lucia helped me with one sermon when the Sunday I had no voice. But Jabez's prayer was this, that, Lord, you bless me. Bless me indeed. Lord, expand my territory, my sphere of influence. Lord, that I might feel your power and your presence and your hand and your spirit guiding me. And that I will stay out of mischief along the way. Isn't that what it was? Have you been praying that this week? I know I have. I've been praying it every day. And Lord knows all sorts of things have been happening. All sorts of things have been happening. Reverend Steve Peters, wave at us, Reverend Steve. Reverend Steve Peters and I were on the Sheena Metal Experience for two hours, a radio show here in town, for two hours this week. She gave us the whole two hours in the program to just talk about Metropolitan Community Church. That's all we talked about was Metropolitan Community Church. We talked about this congregation. We talked about our denomination, which started from this congregation. You knew, folks, if you didn't know already, Metropolitan Community Church is a worldwide denomination that started 50 years ago from this congregation. Now there are churches all over the world where everybody can come. Everybody is welcome where everyone can come to the communion table. Everyone is welcome. Nobody is left out. And nobody's here to try to change you from being you. We're here to encourage you to be the real McCoy, to be the real you, to be 100% you. 
Oh, oh, let me go another step, by the way. Reverend Steve and I were on our way out, and these four guys, four hunky guys, hunky guys, <laughs> really good-looking guys, I'm telling you. They were. They were really good-looking guys. They have their own radio program. There are four of them. And, and they started, we started, you know, they were really friendly, and we started talking to them, and they found out who we were, and they were just really going on being their true selves, and then they said, and who are you and what do you do? And we said, I said, well, I'm Reverend Keith Mazingo. And they all were like, oh, it's a reverend. <laughs> you could have let off with that before I just spouted off everything I just said. And I said, why? <laughs> why? We want you to be your authentic self. We want you to be you. And if that's the real you, then let us decide if we want to hang out with you or not. And before it was over, they had both of our numbers and ready to schedule each of us to go back another day on separate days, me one day, him another day, to talk about MCC and to find out about this, how in the world can you have a church where gay people are not told that they can't be gay anymore? And trans people show up and maybe consecrating communion where bisexual people can bring a, a male this week and a female next week with them to church or an intersexed person can be truly and, and, and I told him I said you know my, one of my best friends uh, is, is this woman named Vicki Vicki Davis that came to Baton Rouge and I just love her I think I've told you before but you'll probably hear me tell you 15 more times Vicki moved to Baton Rouge from out of state and went to LSU working on her doctorate. And she showed up at church and got involved in the church. In fact, she was so good at volunteering, we put her in charge of all the volunteers. She had her own key to the church, her own security code. She had her key to the office. She worked on, the, on, on keeping up with all the hours, the little blue cards that we turned in about our community service. She took care of all of that. When we needed a volunteer for something, she lined them up and scheduled it. She did all of that. And, and she worked with us on the Gay Pride uh, team because we had a, a, a Gay Pride team there at the church. And, and so uh, one day... We're, we're sitting in a meeting, and I overhear her talking to someone. And they said something about her being a lesbian. She said, oh, I'm not a lesbian. I'm asexual. And my ear perked up. I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. She's never mentioned that, but that's okay. And then they said something about her coming to church there, and, she, and they asked her about how she felt about that, and she said, and they said, you're a Christian, and blah, 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 blah. She said, oh, no, I'm not a Christian. I'm an atheist. <laughs> now, 20 years ago, this Keith would have said, okay, maybe we don't need you to volunteer. Maybe you're not so welcome here. I know you can't imagine me being like that, but I was very conservative and it had to be by the rules. And if it wasn't like us, it wasn't a cookie cutter like us, it wasn't right. Because we had a monopoly on the truth, you see. But then the real Keith finally came through, thank God. The real Keith finally got the message. And I said, well, why are you here? And she said, Reverend Keith, when I moved here, I didn't know anybody. And I needed a community. We all need community. We all need community. We can't live it in isolation. Life is not meant to be in isolation. We need a community. Yeah, but Reverend Keith, sometimes my community lets me down. Guess what? Sometimes they let Jesus down too. Guess what? He kept being Jesus. He stayed in community with them even when they didn't deserve his community. Yes, we may hurt your feelings somewhere along the way. Guess what? You can still be in community because that's part of community. Now, we're not going to do it all the time. We're not going to hurt your feelings all the time. Hopefully, we're going to be uplifting you most of the time. 
hopefully all the time. She said, I needed to be in community. And because I am asexual and an atheist in the South, there aren't many places of welcome for me. But when I found your church, I found a place to welcome me because I needed a community that wouldn't judge me for who I am, for being my authentic self, for me being the real McCoy, you see. She said, and I needed, third of all, to go somewhere where they were doing good things. And this church does some great things. You do some really good things. It's a small church, but y'all do a whole lot of stuff for this community. And I'm just telling you, if we can find our way to that goal, that everybody is genuinely welcome here, no matter their faith background or lack thereof, no matter what they proclaim or labels that they wear, and we, we can just say, I love you just the way you are. I'm glad you are part of my faith community. You bless me. And really get in and be part of a community that is making things happen to be able to say, this is the year that God acts. This is the year that things start happening. This is the year when we are our true and genuine selves so we can go out there and let them see what the real deal is. Let them see what the real McCoy is all about. People are going to know if you're just going through the motions. They're going to know whenever I invite you to go and welcome, you know, that... Uh, hospitality moment, that passing of the peace moment, where we go and welcome, especially the new folks. They know if we mean it. They know if we mean we're really glad you are here. We really are glad you're here. We really are thrilled that you came to worship with us today. And I really did mean it a while ago when I said, if you don't have a church home, well, welcome. I hope you just found it. I really do hope that. We've had prophetic words around here that we're going to grow and grow and grow. I had one last week from a friend of mine. She's coming next month to preach for us, Dr. Joyce Turner Keller. And she, she, she started prophesying over the phone with me. She said, I just keep seeing your church is growing. Your church is going to grow. Your church is going to grow. Your church is going to grow. And I'm like, in a day when churches are falling off in attendance, ours is going to grow. This, and she didn't know what I was preaching about. And I'm like, this is the year. This is God's year to act. But it's not just God's year. It's our year to act. To act. To be hospitable. To be generous. But to be genuine. And be our true, authentic selves. To go out and be the real McCoy. Right. Amen. <laughs>
And just as this is God's year to act, February is our month to act as well. And a few of the ways that we can come into action this month will be as shown on the announcements today. Um, February promises to be a month of sharing, of love, of outreach, and entertainment here at Founders. On Tuesday, February 5th, at 7 p.m., up in the upstairs offices, Alive with Dignity, our HIV support group, will be meeting. See Ernie Cornish, who is at the soundboard, for more details in regards to that. Next Sunday, February 10th, at both the 9 and the 11 o'clock services, just in time for Valentine's Day, there will be a special blessing of relationships. For those of you who have one, please bring that special person in your life to church for a time of prayer and recognition. And then on Valentine's evening, Thursday, February 14th, all are welcome to join us in a celebration of love, Founders MCC style, from 7 to, 7 to 10 p.m down in the social hall. It's a time to share potluck food and to share our stories with people we know and people we haven't yet met. This month's board of directors meeting will be on Tuesday, February 19th, beginning at 6.15 in the pastor's conference room upstairs. All are welcome and it's a great way to hear about the parts of this, com of this community, of this ministry and of this outreach that you don't hear from the pulpit every Sunday. And then finally, this month on February 23rd, Saturday, February 23rd, starting at 6.30 p.m., Founders MCC will be hosting a print and film showcase featuring trans artivists. And I say artivists because I'm combining artists and activists because I believe that that's who these people are. Come out, watch their films, see their artwork, and meet the folks who are responsible for bringing this to us. Light food, light drink, and beverages will be provided with a suggested donation of $10. Please come. It'll be a great night of film, of food, and of fun. And finally, before the ushers come forward to collect our tithes and offerings, Jane Siftestad has an announcement. She says my name so well. I love I've it. Known it for a long time. <laughs> Amen. This summer is uh, MCC's Worldwide Denominations General Conference. We meet every three years in a city somewhere in the world, all of the congregations from all around the world. This summer it's in Orlando, Florida, and it happens to be our 50th. We're celebrating our 50th, and this is the founding congregation. We have been um, honored and privileged to um, accept the role of doing music for the worship services, for the daily worship services. So I will be the music lead. Peter Kirkpatrick from the 130 service, the music director for ICM, is my assistant. And um, our band, our 11 o'clock band, Garrett, Susie, and Jeff have been invited to be one of two bands that will provide the instrumental music and the accompaniment for the services. Here's where we need your help. Peter and I, um, in our positions, have our expenses paid, but our band needs to raise the money. So they've accepted it, but it, it is a solely volunteer role. So they are looking to raise money in the next few months. Each one of them needs to raise $2,000 to pay for airfare, hotel, and food for each day that they're there. Um, so it, we are asking this month um, if you are willing to donate either in the form of money or air miles. Um, if you would just see me and let me know, and I can tell you how to volunteer to do that. It's such a blessing to have our founders musicians be the musicians for this 50th anniversary. So I thank you in advance for your help. And now as the ushers come, I heard Reverend Keefe talk about how we can, how founders work so hard to free people from the prisons of their mind or their spirituality to recover sight to those who are blind, to reach out to the community. But we also need a place where we can come and be filled up and hear the message 
and get pumped up and ready to serve. And that's what this service, that's what this church does for us. And so I invite you to put your money where your heart is and give generously unto God. Thank you. Please remain standing for the great thanksgiving and prayers of the people. God of the prophets, we bless this offering as people who have received your gifts of grace and hope. We return to you a portion of the abundance you have given to us. We dedicate all that we give to your loving purposes, bringing in those who have been cast out, standing strong on behalf of those who are weak, speaking out with your word of joy and justice for all people. May your loving realm increase. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Therefore, with a grateful heart, we say, may God be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our God. Gracious God and bearer of the light that shines upon the paths that lay before us, we come to you knowing that often the shadows upon our life attempt to separate us from your words of life and community. You challenge our lives and call us from places we comfortably call home, only to lead us more deeply into the world you love. How can we understand your holy design? With your gentle healing nudge, you invite us to trust you. And even when we still don't understand, you touch and redeem the broken places of our lives, healing the wounded places of the earth. Inspire our time here this day so that we may receive liberation in your word and be filled to overflowing to share your reconciling love to all people and to all corners of the earth. We pray in your many holy names. Amen. Amen. And, and now, let us take a moment of silence and give God, to, uh, give God thanks for the blessings received and to pray for those in need. For these and all the prayers that are on our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, we pray to God as we sing together a prayer in the spirit of the way Jesus taught us to pray.
Please be seated. Jesus, anointed with the Holy Spirit, preached the good news to the poor, healed the brokenhearted, proclaimed liberty to the captives, gave sight to the blind, and set free those who were oppressed. Through his baptism, death, and resurrection, he freed us and made a new covenant of water and of the bread. And so we remember how before he was to be betrayed, he called those who had journeyed with him, calls us to break bread together, to love one another, and include all those who desire to share in this great table of fellowship. For that night, we remember that Jesus did take the bread and blessed it and broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do so, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, the cup of the vine, and he said, This is my life essence, my blood to be poured out for you. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember the forgiveness that goes from my promise to you. Will you pray with me? God of love, mercy, and hope, Just as the spirit of life inspired Jesus in his ministry, so now breathe your Holy Spirit upon us. On these gifts of the bread and the fruit of the vine, that they meet for us the life that we may have in Christ. May we be empowered to make that life visible through our actions of love in the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In preparation for this feast, I now invite the servers and acolytes and ushers to come forward. For our founders and at MCCs all over the world, this is an open table. Just as Pastor reminded earlier, you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to participate in this feast. We also offer both regular wafers and gluten-free wafers. Just let your server know what your preference may be. And if you prefer to receive communion with no human intervention whatsoever, please know we have set aside sacred elements to my left and then to your right where you can be one with God. For all are welcome to this table of love, mercy, and freedom wherever you are in your journey. All we ask and that God asks is to come and to enjoy the feast. All are welcome.
hope you've enjoyed being in worship with us today. There are a couple more things that are going to happen, but they're going to happen once, once I get to the back. So hang out. Don't be in too much of a rush. But would you rise as you're able and join us in our closing song. ago, February 5th, 2017, which was Super Bowl Sunday, I survived a very brutal home invasion, robbery, assault, and rape. And to those who think that the rape might have been the worst of it, that only lasted a couple of minutes. It has been the recovery from the physical damage that was inflicted on me that I'm still recovering from, which is why you haven't seen much of me these past two years. I spent 27 weeks hospitalized in the aftermath of the assault. And for those who think, oh God, this is awful, he deserves to have done to him, what he did to his six identified victims. He is facing 423 years to life 
in prison as a third striker. The judge gave him 280 years to life, which means he has to serve 280 years before the life part kicks in, plus 143 mandatory state prison. I do not wish him any harm. In my victim impact statement, his mother was present in the courtroom. I didn't know this. His sister told us at sentencing that it meant a great deal to their mother that in the victim impact statement, I was said, I do not wish him harm. Anyone who wishes him harm for what he did to me is voluntarily participating in his cycle of violence. I believe in redemption. He's a child of God just like I am, but at the moment he's in the grafted on bastard side of the family tree and has a whole lot of work to do to get back on the main rooted part of the tree. And I ask that as you continue to keep me in prayer as I recover physically and emotionally, that you also pray for his redemption because he's far more damaged than any of the damage he inflicted on his victims who ranged in age from 24 to 90. He damaged, he caved in my face and when he caved in my face I fell and my leg exploded and that has been the hardest part of my recovery. He then dragged me into my bedroom where he sexually assaulted me. But during that portion of it, I very much felt the presence of God and the rule from the second chapter of the book of Job, where God says, do what you will, but you cannot kill him. He is mine. I felt the presence of our communion of saints right there on the bed with me and knew I was gonna survive. Praise the Lord. Amen. She is, I said. Thank you for your prayers which have sustained me and continue to sustain me throughout the 30 plus years that I have been a part of this church and even through my prolonged absences. Thank you. We're glad that she is well enough to be with us and we're glad for her recovery. She's come a long, long ways. And for those of us that have known her for a long time, we know she's come a long ways. And she's been through a lot in life, but God has always kept her. Always kept her. Always surrounded with angels. Amen. Now, I'm not going to leave you on that note. Because I hear, now this is not my thing, but I hear there's some kind of special thing happening this afternoon. And some of you are probably on your edge to get home to uh, see something on TV. It's, it's what I've heard. I'm not sure. It's not the Oscars, so I don't know really why, why you're in a hurry about. But anyway, so I wanted to share this with you. I was supposed to do it before the sermon, and I got up too quickly. So I'm asking our person upstairs to share this with you. Thank you for the word of the testimonies of our community, people in our community who have been through rough times in their lives, even at the point of death. But just as your word said today, you are always with us. And we thank you for that. We pray that you will bless all that we do and say as we go about our week and help us to go out and be our genuine 100% selves. Help us to go out and be the spiritual real McCoy to a world that needs us for that. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shake hands and be friendly.